Something I thought about. Something I thought about really hard is the the difference in community. Uh, the difference in community. What's what I'm looking for here? Community sentiment and community appeal of diverse formats, diverse metas. When it comes to shooting games, fighting games, and card games, those are the three things I reference a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and where that divide comes from, right? Not only as a more competitively minded player, but as a casually minded player, right? I like all these games casually, but I can also see that they have competitive aspects, and I, I dig those competitive aspects. If I'm not playing them, I'm watching them. Play. What's going to happen in this next big Halo tournament? Uh, when is when is the finals going to get to go esports, right? Uh, oh, when is the next Fortnite championship series? Things like that. Like I pay attention to. These. Of course, we can mention all the fighting games, the Capcom Pro Tour, Dragon Ball Fighters World Tour. These things, the Tekken World Tour just wrapped up, let's fucking go. I try to pay attention to these games competitively, but I also try to pay attention to them casually. Right, we can even throw in a game like League of Legends in here, right? MOBAs and arena shooters. At the, at the low level, at a low level of play, and at a, maybe even a middle level play, a median level play, somewhere right in the middle of the bell curve, you want to make sure your games are diverse enough and balanced enough that any character can do well, can succeed, can make it to, you know, Grandmaster rank or whatever, or uh, Legend rank, or King of Games, whatever the rank is, right, whatever it's called, Master rank. Um, you want to make sure you can get to these things with any character in the game. You don't want any character to be so unviable, any any deck, any archetype, any class in class-based shooters, to be so unviable that they can't be used at the highest level of casual play. And at the highest level of medium level play, mid level play. I'm gonna make sure that that is good, right? So that creates a diverse format for the lower level players. And when I say lower level players, I mean the vast majority of the community, the non upper echelon. Now, when you get to the upper echelon of play, that's where things change. And the reason for that is in hard games, in shooting games, and in MOBAs, more likely, moreover, you want to make sure that the game is more reeled in and there's not too many options. Players want to find the most broken things. And I'm going to be real with you. Players at the highest level of play do not care about balance. They care about finding the most broken shit and using the most broken shit they can with their character, with their, their archetype, with their cards, with their class, whatever it may be. I'm going to be quite honest with you. So if they're talking about balancing character, it is 100% propaganda they just want things changed so that something is easier for them or harder for another more m most of the time if you're a random Joe Schmo watching this video and you are not top 0.01 percent in your game you I'm not talking to you shut the fuck up you're part of the mid-tier players sorry I did you win TI if you're gonna talk to me about Dota right now did you did you win TI okay you didn't shut the fuck up not not talking to you we're not talking about you right now, there's a giant disconnect between the vast majority of players that want a diverse meta and higher level players. And I noticed this, especially in the current Yu-Gi-Oh! climate. There's been debates about what format, like how much of an open format is too open, right? How many decks can be viable without it feeling random, right? Card games already have some form of RNG. But when it comes to uh, card games, generally there's two types of form. There's a two deck format and there's a three deck format. There's a rare case where a format is extremely open and has more than three to four decks. And then there's a rare case on the other end where it's too strong and there's only one powerful deck, right? Those are called tier zero metas, tier, tier S, S metas, whatever you want to call them, where there's only one too powerful deck and everyone in the room is more than likely playing that deck. Anything that is not that deck has a super slim chance of winning and there's almost no point of being the most competitive player in the room and not playing that deck. I've heard rumblings, I've heard talks that tier zero metas are the best for players. And I agree. Tier zero metas are the best for players because generally they are almost always more skill expressive because of the fact that there is only one deck to worry about. Now in a fighting game, we've had tier zero metas before. There was a tier zero meta in Tekken 7 when Leroy launched. Evo Japan there were six Leroy's in top eight. In a card game, that is considered a tier zero meta. Because there is more than 50% representation of the same... Some say 60, some say 50. 
50% representation of the same character, same class, same archetype, or same legend, same hero, right? In something like League of Legends, you've noticed that at the highest levels of play, in something like most arena shooters and most most MOBAs, at the highest level of play, you will see the same small roster of heroes compared to how big, how massive the amount of characters, the amount of legends, heroes, champions there are in the game. At the highest level of play, you'll see maybe 10 of them compared to the 100, 150 that exist. You'll see 7 of them, 8 of them compared to the 40 or 50 that exist. And these things happen because at the highest level of play, people are trying to break down to the core what is the most broken and what has the easiest and best matchups across the board. Whether that be a character, a gun, a class, all of these things, right? These all relate to each other. But at the spectator level, people are saying, boo, I don't want to see this, the same five characters. I don't want to see only lights running around in the finals. That's so boring. Man, I'm tired of seeing every heavy use only nuke and rocket launcher and do nothing else with the class. Man, I'm so tired of all these Ken and Luke's running around in Street Fighter 6. Dude, Happy Chaos is too overtuned and has won everything ever in Guilty Gear Strive. I'm being hyperbolic, of course, these aren't all exactly true, but they are examples. I'm so tired of Tier Limit and Yu-Gi-Oh! Tier Limit fucking took over the format and did too much and the Ishizu cards need to be banned. They're limited to one, so we don't have to really worry about that too much. But these are the kinds of arguments you hear. These are the kinds of things you hear from more casually minded players. I think the highest, the most upper echelon players are going to break down a game to its core and learn these things anyway. So it doesn't really matter. They're not affected, but what is, it, what is, what is affected is the spectator experience. Spectators don't want to watch the same deck across an entire top eight playing mirror matches. Spectators don't want to see the the same sidearm and main arm in Call of Duty in competitive for five tournaments in a row. Okay, they don't. That's not good for spectators. Unfortunately, you have to find a really good balance. You have to find a good balance because at some point it does become too random, right? If you have too diverse of a meta, you can call it more skill expressive. I want to see nothing but Shimena's in top eight of Pocket Bravery. <laughs> it when you when you look at a game like a card game let's say a card game card games you want to play for the field you want to tune your main deck and your side deck to beat as many decks as there are in the field that are viable right you don't want to have a bunch of different silver bullets for 15 different decks across the board you want to have generally a triangle format i think that we can look back in the history of magic the gathering we can go back to I think it was Kaladesh. Maybe it wasn't Kaladesh. It was probably something like Hour of Devastation, maybe early Ixalan format, right? Right around the time that Search for Ascanta came out, you can look up that Magic the Gathering card, Search for Ascanta. It's really good for control decks. If you read it and you understand just a little bit about card games, you understand that the card selection from that card early in the game when you're not trying to establish a board presence, because it's a turn to play, where mid-range decks and aggro decks would already be getting their engines maybe started, or putting out something to uh, accelerate. That is control player's version of acceleration. I think that during that format, we had a perfectly stable and solid, thanks for the lurk, appreciate you, gangy, but a perfectly sta stable and solid three deck format. There was a, a good few kinds of, there was a good few decks on the fringes, right? Right outside of that tier one, right outside of that best deck contention, but those decks weren't winning. You never saw one of those crazy decks win. You saw them maybe make it into the top eight. You saw them make it into the top cut, top 16, top 32 of like national level, world level events, but almost always the decks you were going to see win were energy, red aggro of some kind, whether it be red or red black or blue eye control. There was, there was also like an Esper control list uh, that started to do well towards the tail end because it needed to be curated. It needed to be fully um, fully locked in against the meta. I just said locked in. Damn. Fully locked in against the meta and understand like what the real threats were so that they could div build a diverse main deck to beat all of the other decks. Uh, but generally, those were the three biggest decks to beat, right? If you were a competitive player, you were almost always playing one of those decks. And the reason why is because they were just so pushed and so powerful that it was hard to play anything else. You understood what was going on in the room. That's like in a fighting game, if there's too many characters, it becomes hard to, and too many characters and too many viable characters, where it becomes hard to lab versus every single character. We can look at a game like Smash Ultimate, for instance, right? The best characters are still winning, right? You're still seeing the Pyromithras, the, the Clouds, the Sonics and the Minecraft Steves and the Game and Watches, right? You're still seeing these characters win. But you're also seeing these characters sometimes upset by the weaker characters in the game. 
and not because the weaker characters in the game generally have good matchups against them, but moreover because of the fact that these characters aren't seen as much, so they're labbed against less. Right? And you could say it's up to the player, they need to do their due diligence, they need to do their labbing, but these open formats create more volatility, chaos, and randomness, which is really good for the spectators, right? I would really love to see an Isabella in top 8. That would be so fucking cool. I would love to see a a Bowser Jr. in top 8. That would be hype as hell. But is it something that should be seen regularly um, where the, the players who are better almost always, or the players who are more consistent almost always, start to lose because of randomness and volatility? No, that's not what we want in a stable competitive orbit. So when it comes to being competitive, yes, we probably need less options. And I don't mean less options per character, I mean less options when it comes to the viable types of characters, or the viable amount of characters. When it comes to smaller rosters, this is less of an issue, right? When you look at something like Street Fighter 6, most characters have qualified for Capcom Cup, there's a few that haven't, I think four or five, right? Uh, but the vast majority of characters have qualified for a Capcom Cup, which means that this meta is pretty open and diverse, but the roster is also pretty small. Something that wouldn't be as applicable is if it was a Smash World Tour and the World Tour Finals was 64 people. There's no way in hell we're seeing 64 in, in individual, 64 unique entries in that. We'll see a few clouds, a few... Minecraft Thieves, a few Pyramithers, and a few Game of Watches and Sonics. You're not going to see the same, you're not going to see one of each character make it into that because the, the the meta is just, first of all, the meta is fully developed. Most people really understand the game as it is fully, but it's also just really hard to make it in that way. And I don't think that it would be a really good viewer experience, to be quite honest, if the best players in the world weren't making it in because they got randomed out by Bowser Jr. and Isabella. A little Mac, right? These characters are generally weaker, and I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of backing on that. Do we need balance? Do we want balance in fighting games? Yes, we want some amount of balance. I think at medium level play and at casual level play, every character should be somewhat viable and able to win every gun in Call of Duty, every class in Overwatch, um, the finals, every a good amount of archetypes should be playable at a casual level. There's just some dookie dog shit archetypes in a game like Yu-Gi-Oh, okay, in a game like Pokemon. Some decks and cards and Pokemon are just not meant to be good. But generally, at the highest level of play, you want a more scoped-in field. You know, I think anything in card games, anything above like five decks is generally too high. In, car in shooting games, anything above three or four viable guns right that don't have immediate counterplay to each other in that four or five guns it's probably too many right i i know it like really ruins player player agency and player uh player creativity no because as you play with that gun you can still create your own style of offense or defense or rotation patterns just with the map right there's this map there's team play there's guns there's it guns are not the only factor right grenade placement anyways every game has has something different, right? Every game has some balance that needs to be done, some tuning. Uh, but a diverse meta is not always the best thing. I think generally, after the points I stated, right? It was a little, it was a little ranty, but I think after the points I stated, we can all agree that at the highest level of play, really volatile and random play being possibly considered the best is not a good thing. I think there was an, uh, like a quote by Seth Killian, right? Like where he referred to uh, competitive gaming as like a stable comp they want to create a stable competitive orbit in like a field of randomness because at casual level and mid-level play it's more often than not very random right you'll find a lot of things that shouldn't work or don't work at higher levels of play work at mid-level and at casual level play so that stable competitive orbit almost always comes with reining things in reining in the moves you would use reining in the cards you would play in your deck reining in the types of aggressive pushes you would make in something like a team shooter or even something like a CSGO or a Valorant uh, and reining in your team composition in something like a MOBA. Diverse metas are fun to watch but not always fun to play in. Whether you agree or disagree, tell me your opinions on it down below in the comments of the video. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, I'm trying to get to 500 subscribers. If I get to 500 subscribers, just keep going, keep hitting subscribe. Tell your friends to watch my video if you liked it. Tell them to hit subscribe. Share the video on your Facebook pages and your Twitters and your Instagrams and all of that. And this has been Beanie Sluggish talking about diverse metas and real den metas. 
which are better for competitive and for spectators, casually or mid-level. Signing out and saying, peace.